Good afternoon. <clears throat> um, welcome. My name is Jim Pastoriza. I'm a member of the class of 88, and uh, we're still here. And uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Michelle Hamlin. Uh, we were just talking about the benefits that we've all received from our recent tax cut and how good that's going to be long term. And uh, what drove that was obviously corporate tax reform. So Michelle is going to talk a bit about how that all happened and what corporations are doing or what they're likely to do with that. Uh, she teaches a course here on tax and business strategy. Uh, she teaches the introductory financial accounting course. Uh, her research focuses primarily on the intersection of taxation and financial accounting. Uh, she, her recent work examines the capital markets and reputational effects of corporate tax avoidance, uh, the economic consequences of U.S. international tax policies for multinational corporations, the effect of individual level taxes. You're really busy, aren't you? You've got a lot going on. Uh, and the extent of individual level offshore tax evasion. Some of us will be interested in that subject. Uh, she is editor of one of the leading accounting research journals and has won lots of awards for her research and is the winner of the 2013 Jameson Prize for Excellence at Teaching at Sloan. So way to go. Uh, she has co-authored two textbooks, uh, Financial Accounting and Taxes in Business Strategy. If you brought your copies, I suspect she'll autograph them uh, afterwards. And she's also testified in front of the U.S. Senate Committee on Finance. That's got to be a lot of fun. Uh, and the House of Representatives Committees uh, on Ways and Means Regarding Tax Policy. And she was recently an academic fellow at the House Ways and Means Majority Tax Staff. Uh, she has a BBA from Eastern Illinois and uh, MACC in Taxation from Missouri and a PhD in Accounting from uh, University of Washington. So without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Michelle Hansen. So thank you. Uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome back to MIT for the reunion event. Um, so what I thought I would do is uh, give an overview of the recent Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So this is a, one of the most uh, common things I hear from my prior students is what changed, you know, uh, I wish I could take your class again because of a lot of things changed. So I thought I'd give an overview of what actually happened in the Tax Act and talk a little bit about the history of tax reform. You know, how did we actually get to this place that we needed to do this tax reform that we just did? When I say we, I just mean the US. <laughs> um, and then what I thought uh, I would do is really talk about why it is we needed tax reform, especially on the corporate side. Talk about the corporate provisions that are in the tax act, the recent tax act. Uh, and then hopefully uh, we'll have time that I can talk a little bit about what we see corporations doing and what we think they'll do going forward with respect to this, this act. And then we'll open it up for, for Q&A. Uh, so, um, so again, what I thought I would do is just start by going over the different provisions in the act. And this act was quite comprehensive in the sense that it has uh, corporate provisions, individual provisions, pass-through provisions, and the state and gift tax provisions in it. And so when I say corporate, what I mean is uh, the corporate tax, uh, what we know as a C corporation, and that's the enti legal entity that actually pays an entity level tax. Uh, so what happened with that uh, part of the code is that we reduced the corporate tax rate down to 21%. This was probably the driving um, kind of force behind this tax reform is to get that corporate rate down, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Uh, but now the corporate rate is set at 21%, and that's a 21% flat rate for C corporations. Uh, previously, we had a top rate of 35%. So you can see this is quite a substantial reduction in, in the corporate tax rate. There's other provisions in the code that affect corporations too. So we went to full expensing. What that means is if a business invests in, say, a piece of equipment, they can deduct the entire cost of that piece of equipment in the year that they buy it. Uh, previously, you know, they had to depreciate that equipment over a certain number of years. Uh, now, also, though, however, what they also did at the same time was limit interest expense deductibility. So uh, when companies borrow, they can't deduct, potentially, they can't deduct uh, all that interest expense that they might have to pay. There's also some other uh, provisions uh, with respect to the corporate code. Probably the, the next biggest change is that we fundamentally changed how we tax 
the foreign earnings of our US multinationals. So if we have a, a company, corporation or otherwise, actually is some kind of business that operates in the US and in a foreign country, we really changed how we're gonna tax them and I'll walk through that um, in a little bit. Um, the other big thing in this tax act was the tax reduction for pass-through entities. And when I say pass-through entity, what I mean is a, an entity that does not pay, some business that does not pay an entity level tax, the income flows through to the individual and the taxes are paid at the individual level. So this is like a LLC or an S corp or a partnership, sole proprietorship, all those types of entities, those are known as pass-throughs. And uh, what happened in this tax act for the pass-throughs was that they will now get a 20% deduction on their business income. So basically only 80% of that business income will be, only be included in their, their tax return. Uh, it's quite complicated though, there's lots of limitations. Uh, the Wall Street Journal recently had kind of a video about this where a guy's running through an obstacle course like trying to figure out how in the world this provision actually works. So it's, it's uh, quite complicated, but in essence it will drop the individual rate from 37% to around 296 for this type of business income. Uh, this was kind of a huge political sticking point uh, in the act. Uh, remember what I said is that the goal of the act, one of the main goals is to drop the corporate tax rate. So what pass-throughs would say is that, look, you know, we have business income, they have business income, why is their rate going to 21% and our rate is gonna stay at the individual rate, 37%. So it was a big kind of political push. They had to get this rate down if they wanted to get the corporate rate down. And this is how it was achieved. And then many of the provisions that I talked about for C-Corps also apply here. In other words, interest limitation, the international provisions, and, and various things like that. Now on the individual side, what happened uh, is that we reduced the, the individual rates as well. The top rate was 39.6, and now it's 37%. The state and local deduction, which many of you probably know about, uh, we used to be able to, on our itemized deductions, deduct state and local income taxes, property taxes, or your sales taxes. Uh, but now what they did is limit that deduction to $10,000 per person, per either individual or $10,000 on a joint return. This has turned out to be quite a big deal um, after the fact. A lot of people don't like that they're, this deduction is limited. <laughs> uh, so states are trying a workaround, actually, if you've heard about this. So for example, California is working on setting up a charitable fund, and maybe what they're trying to do is that individuals could contribute to this charitable fund for the good of California, and then California will give them a credit on their California state tax return. Uh, some other states are trying something similar to this. Probably it won't work, um, and the US government has said they will probably not let it work. Uh, but we don't know for sure, uh, but there's kind of a, a political uh, debate about this. Uh, personal exemptions were eliminated on the individual return. The standard deduction, though, was doubled, so it's $24,000 uh, for married couple. Mortgage interest deduction was limited. It used to be $1.1 million, now it's $750,000. Interest on debt of $750,000. Now, the AMT alternative minimum tax, probably a lot of you have paid the alternative minimum tax uh, at some point in your life. Uh, the alternative minimum tax is a tax where the U.S. says, we're going to compute your tax on a regular, the regular income tax system. Then we're going to make you compute the tax on this alternative system. And whichever one's higher, that's when you're going to pay, okay? And, uh, but now what they did, and a lot of people were subject to it. So five, over 5 million taxpayers would have been subject to it in 2018. What they did is they uh, changed the rules for the AMT, and really only about 200,000 taxpayers should have to pay the AMT in, this, in 2018 now. They also expanded the child tax credit, uh, basically doubled it to $2,000. Okay, they also changed the estate tax provisions as well. So the estate tax, that's another tax we have in the US. That's a tax upon your wealth when you die. Um, they basically doubled the exemption from the estate tax, so now it's 11, almost $11.2 million per person. Okay, So it's quite a comprehensive tax act in a lot of ways, um, and a lot of things were changed. You know, uh, one thing I hear quite a lot is that uh, this tax reform was, you know, 
rammed through and wasn't thought through and done very quickly, this type of thing. So I want to kind of give you an idea of the history. How did we actually end up here? And um, so the large, last time we had large scale tax reform was 1986. This was Ronald Reagan. This is Reagan with his tax acts. He wanted to reduce tax rates. Uh, so tax rates before he was in office, the individual rates were in excess of 70%, and the corporate rate was uh, in excess of 45% or so. So there was a big tax reform act in 86. This was like um, you know, the stuff of legend historically in the tax world. Uh, they got this tax act done. It was quite comprehensive and bipartisan back in 1986. Since then, we've had other tax acts, but in general, they're not what you would call comprehensive tax reform. Uh, they've been, um, you know, uh, in 1993, the corporate rate was raised 1%, actually raised 1%. And then there's been a series of tax acts after that that were smaller in nature and generally only dealt with the individual side of the tax code, generally tax cuts for individuals. Okay, but not much on the corporate side. So the corporate rate, stayed at 35% through all these years. Then uh, what happened in 2014, uh, the House Ways and Means Committee Chairman, Dave Camp, he released a very comprehensive proposal for tax reform. And this had been worked on for several years. This was a big effort. Uh, I testified in 2012, and I'm pretty sure there were hearings before then. Uh, so a lot of work, work went into this. And basically what this proposal suggested that we do, or proposed that we do, is drop the corporate rate to 25% and broaden the tax base. Uh, when I say broaden the tax base, I mean get rid of a lot of deductions to pay for the drop in the corporate tax rate down to 25%. Classic Reagan style tax reform. And then it was uh, going to change the way we tax international earnings. Okay, and I'll, I'll talk about that again in a minute. Uh, but that was this plan. It was basically dead on arrival. There was no way this was going to pass. The minute it was released, everyone said it was dead. Uh, and basically because the idea, I think, was that the rate kind of only got to 25%, and they had to give up a lot to get there. So a lot of deductions were taken away, and we still could only get the rate to 25%. So a lot of people didn't like this. Uh, so uh, work continued, more hearings. Um, and I was at the Ways and Means Committee in between these two proposals. Uh, in 2016, uh, Chairman Brady, who Kevin Brady is the chair of the Ways and Means Committee now, and he was in 2016, and Speaker Ryan, Paul Ryan, who was the chair, and then he moved to the Speaker's office, they released a plan called the Better Way Blueprint. And this plan was a real change in thinking. This was big tax reform. And it was big because it tried to move us more toward what's known as a consumption tax, kind of away from an income tax system. So it got the corporate rate to 20% lower. Uh, and this time it had immediate expensing of investments. So instead of broadening the base, it actually narrowed the base in some sense. But the key of it was that it, it did this border adjustment. And what that border adjustment was, is it uh, was basically that export revenue would not be taxable and import costs would not be deductible. This operates very much like a European-style consumption tax, value-added tax. Uh, it didn't pass. There was a lot of attention on this uh, and a lot of studies done about the, how this would work. But it was a big change in thinking. There's no economy in the world that has this kind of tax, really. And so people, there was a lot of uncertainty about how it would actually work. And so it didn't pass um, and didn't really get all that far. Um, but anyway, that, that was one of the proposals that happened. There was a lot of thinking that went into this. In this act, also, they did limit interest expense in this proposal, and they proposed this new rate for pass-throughs. And this is the first time kind of we saw this new rate for pass-throughs be proposed. Okay, so, so this is kind of the history. And a, a, so there was a lot of work. This is the point I'm trying to make. There was a lot of work that went into this over the years from at least 2012 until 2017 when this last act was passed. Um, and why did we need tax reform? What was really the main driving um, factor or problem that we had? Here's the two main issues. One is that we had this corporate tax rate that was 35%, which is uh, quite high relative to the rest of the world, which I'll show you. And we had this worldwide tax system, okay? So let's start with the rate. 
This is a, kind of a graph that shows the corporate statutory tax rate in different areas around the world. These are simple averages for 2017. This is the EU worldwide, the OECD average, countries that are members of the OECD, the G20 and the G7. The US rate, these are federal uh, statutory rates plus subnational rates. So in the US, that would mean the federal rate plus the state rate. And in the US, before this recent tax act, it would have been around 39 to 40%. And you can see, so that's quite, quite a bit higher than other countries around the world, our corporate tax rate. And if you just take one example, this is the UK. And you can see over recent years, they have significantly reduced their corporate tax rate in the UK. Whereas the US, we were still sitting at 35% federal rate. So we had this really relatively high corporate statutory tax rate relative to the rest of the world. And you know, even there was a lot of pressure on the US to get this rate down. So I get off an airplane at Reagan Airport in Washington, DC, and there's this ad, a billboard, about the corporate tax rate. You know, it's usually like Gucci bags, vineyard buying clothes, exotic vacation places. But this billboard was about the corporate statutory tax rate. It was just quite shocking. Uh, but there was, there was a lot of kind of pressure on the US to get the rate down. The UK had dropped the rate, Japan had dropped the rate, and most other countries had a lower rate than us. So we also had what, what I described as a worldwide tax system with deferral. And what does that mean? OK, so, so uh, let's imagine that we have a US corporation, a company that's incorporated in the US. That makes them a US company. Um, and so we have a US multinational. And let's just you know, pick a random state. Let's say they're from California. And then let's say they have a subsidiary in some random foreign country, let's say Ireland. OK, uh, so we have a US multinational with a subsidiary in Ireland. Ireland's a big tax haven. I didn't pick it randomly. Uh, so let's say we have this situation. How the tax code in the US worked prior to 2018 was that we would say, hey, US corporation, you're going to owe US tax on all your earnings around the world. We're going to tax everything you earn in the US. But if it's active earnings in a foreign subsidiary, uh, we're not actually going to tax that until you bring it home. So you can defer that US taxation until you repatriate the cash back to the US parent company. And that's what I mean by worldwide with deferral. Most other countries uh, have what's known as a territorial system, meaning they don't tax in the home country earnings of the corporations that are earned outside the home country. Okay, so the US had this, you know, kind of what was thought of as an onerous system by a lot of people in the sense that we tax worldwide earnings, even though we gave them this deferral. Okay, so this system led to kind of a lot of economic outcomes that we could see in our research and just even anecdotally. So those negative economic outcomes, it, having a very high tax rate in the home country and low tax rates in other countries, like Ireland was 12.5% or lower if you negotiated with them, uh, it gave companies a lot of incentives to shift earnings to these low tax jurisdictions. It also gave companies incentives to locate intangibles in low tax jurisdictions and then manufacturing in low tax jurisdictions or other jurisdictions around the world. In other words, we were losing economic activity out of the US into foreign jurisdictions because of our tax code. Uh, it also uh, gave a lot of incentives to companies once we earned the earnings in the foreign jurisdiction to leave the earnings in the foreign jurisdiction because remember, they'd have to pay that 35% tax once they brought the earnings back. So you can see there's a lot of um, research on this and studies. These are kind of just some graphs. This is one by Credit Suisse that looked at the earnings that companies reported in their financial statements that were located in foreign jurisdictions. In other words, the earnings that companies were reporting in foreign jurisdictions were increasing over time uh, as this uh, tax differential got bigger and bigger, as the foreign countries dropped their tax rates and the US stayed the same. And in terms of just pure cash, you can see also if companies that disclose it anyway, you can see that the cash holdings off, you know, in these foreign subsidiaries is quite high. Uh, 
In other words, you saw U.S. multinationals sitting on a lot of cash, not reinvested earnings. They're just having a lot of cash on their balance sheet. And one big factor you know, that drove that was the U.S. tax code. Apple alone, uh, in the middle of 2017, in their 10K, reported that they had $246 billion of just cash and cash equivalents, and Microsoft had around $130 billion. Uh, and you can see here the overall estimate at the end of 2015 was about $1.7 trillion. So there's you know, a lot of negative economic outcome. There's also then an incentive to borrow in the US. So what we have going on are companies shifting income and manufacturing and earnings offshore. Then they have to leave the cash offshore. So then how do they fund their US operations and do um, shareholder payback programs? They borrow in the US and then they pay. And of course, that interest was deductible in the US. So we had this crazy system of keeping all this cash away from the US parent. They're borrowing in the US, reducing their tax bill here. Uh, we surveyed uh, companies back in 2007, actually. And one of the papers that we published um, was in 2010. And we asked them a lot of questions. We um, ended up getting 600 companies to reply to the survey. And we asked them a lot of questions about their international tax, their tax planning in general, um, you know, a lot of things that they would decide with respect to taxes. And one of the things we asked them was, what actions have you taken um, in order to avoid the repatriation tax in the US? And the most common response we got is, yeah, we borrow in the US so that we don't have to repatriate our foreign earnings. Um, and then we, the second most common answer was we invest in financial assets with a lower rate of return than we could get by investing in the US, meaning they just have to hold them in, in some kind of cash or cash equivalent because they can't reinvest their earnings back in the US. So a lot of negative economic outcomes from this kind of tax system that we had. There was also quite a bit of evidence that we had negative consequences in terms of what we call the market for corporate control. This would be merger and acquisition. So if there was a, a cross-border merger and acquisition, the, tax, the new tax home of the combined entity was almost never in the US. Because it would not have been a smart tax move to put the tax home in the US. Uh, there was also quite a lot of incentives we found. Uh, we, we wrote a study about acquisitions of companies that have a lot of cash offshore, meaning in their foreign subsidiaries. And what we found was that these companies that are kind of sitting on a lot of cash due to the tax system of the US, they're much more likely to buy a foreign company other than a US company. And the market return to that investment is generally less positive to the market return to other acquisitions that either companies with less cash offshore make or that companies that invest in the US. Meaning, the company just needs something to do with the cash, so they invest in these foreign companies, but it, the shareholders don't really think it's that value enhancing for them to make that decision. So we, we wrote that study uh, a few years ago and we found evidence consistent with, with all those things I just described. So there's all these ne negative economic outcomes, and then there's also the outcome that companies uh, had incentives to invert. And this was in the press a lot. Uh, Pfizer tried to do this, uh, but basically companies were trying to leave the US, take their tax home out of the US, and become a foreign company. It used to be this was very easy to do. You could just do this on paper. Uh, but over time, the US government has put in rules that has made this quite a lot harder, and you have to actually engage in an actual M&A transaction with a foreign partner. Um, and so there were a lot of incentives to try to invert and get out of the US tax system. So when I testified, this is how I summarized it. You know, it was basically like all these negative consequences to this tax system that we have. It causes companies to operate outside the US, leave cash outside the US, borrow within the US, and get acquired by foreign companies. And it's more likely for them to make less value enhancing acquisitions themselves. So there's a lot of negative economic outcomes that we could associate with the tax system that we had previously. This is the high corporate tax rate and the worldwide tax system that we had in place. So sometimes people will counter, or try to counter with, hey, you know, that's a statutory rate. It's not the effective rate. Isn't it true that companies really didn't pay the statutory rate? 
And, and that's true to some degree uh, that effective rates might differ from the statutory rate. But one thing, uh, back in 2008, uh, I published a paper with a couple of co-authors that we look at uh, effective tax rate, cash effective tax rates of US companies. And um, this ended up getting picked up by the press, actually, and the, the press actually have a much better graph than we, we had in our paper. So I show the one from <laughs> uh, the New York Times, not, you know, our paper's like all academic regressions and everything. This is like a really simple, uh, nice uh, diagram. Uh, but anyway, what, what they show, you know, is that there's a lot of variation in the effective tax rates. So these are effective tax rates for companies. And the size of the circle is the market cap of the company. And you can see, you know, there's some companies that pay very little in effective tax rates. And we found that to be true in our paper. There's, there's some companies that can persistently pay a very low tax rate. But then there are some companies that have very high tax rates. And you know, it's, it's actually hard in the research. A lot of people have tried this, but it's very hard to explain why that is. Um, you know, we can't explain all the variation in these rates. But anyway, what, what I want to show you with this is that there's a large variation in the rates. And this generally should tell you that there's something wrong with the tax system. You know, we have a high statutory rate, but then a large variation in effective rates, and it just doesn't seem equitable. Uh, so that, this is, you know, um, I think the effective rates and the situation that we can see with the effective rates was actually another signal that something was wrong with our system before. So, so what did we do, the U.S., <laughs> what did the U.S. do with this tax reform that we just did? So like I said, the, the, the Tax Act, what it did is reduce this corporate statutory tax rate down to 21%. And this gets us in line pretty much with the rest of the world. So if we combine that with our subnational rates, that will get us to a 25, 26% rate. And the OECD rate, if you remember, was around 24. So this puts us in line with kind of the OECD average. Now, the trouble is other countries might react, right, to our tax act that we just enacted. And in fact, all these countries either announced before or after our tax act that they're going to reduce their corporate income tax uh, further than what they already have. Um, but really, the potential effect should be that with our lower corporate tax rate now, there should be lower incentives for companies to shift income out, out of the U.S. There should be increased incentives for companies to invest in the U.S. And this is a goal, right? We don't want to lose investment in economic activity to foreign jurisdictions. We want to attract that activity to our, our country. And so this should increase incentives for companies to invest here in the U.S. Um, we also, like I said, we, we enacted this full expensing. Uh, economists love full expensing. Um, they think, you know, if you can expense, deduct immediately the cost of your equipment, you'll buy more equipment. Um, and it, we should see an effect from this, uh, ideally. Um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see how much of an effect we see, but it should, we should see an increase in investment in response to this part of the tax act. Now, the fundamental part with respect to the international earnings, this is, this is probably one of the most complicated parts of the Tax Act, uh, but one of the most interesting at the same time. So if you remember how I described our old tax system is that we had worldwide taxation. And now, kind of in theory, what we're moving to is this territorial system that I described, where ideally we're only going to tax in the US earnings that's earned in the US and earnings that are earned in a foreign jurisdiction that would be a pure territorial system where the earnings in the foreign jurisdiction we don't tax in the US. Now, there's a big risk with that. If we still have a 21% rate and Ireland has a 12.5% rate and there's no, we're not going to tax earnings in Ireland, that would actually increase the incentive to shift income to Ireland. So what countries have to do when they move to this territorial type system is also put in some protections so that companies don't shift too much income. In other words, they're going to put in some kind of punishment or a stick okay, to keep companies from shifting income and stripping the US tax base. And what the US did is they put in these two provisions. And I did not make these up. The acronyms actually are guilty <laughs> and the beat. <laughs> That's really what they're called. Uh, so one is a global intangible low tax income, the guilty, and one is the beat, the base erosion and anti-abuse tax. And uh, these provisions are uh, quite complicated. I'll try to explain them in a big picture sense. 
And then they, we also have what's called this foreign derived intangible income provision. And what that is, is basically a carrot. This is an incentive for companies to do activity in the US and export out of the US. The acronym for that is FDII. <laughs> and it turns out that this has turned into a generational split. So apparently millennials call this FIDI and older people call it FODI. Uh, apparently there's some rapper that's like 50 cents that goes by FIDI, so the younger people like FIDI. Um, <laughs> So I don't know, it, it turned into like this big uh, debate of what to call this. But um, anyway, that, that's that part of the act. OK, so the big thing you might have heard about already in the press, in the Wall Street Journal, is that there's this transition tax. So if you imagine that we are moving from a worldwide tax to a territorial tax, somehow we have to figure out what are we going to do with all those earnings that these companies had sitting offshore? Are we going to treat them like we're still under the old regime and just tax them at 35%? Or are we going to say, hey, we're now in a, a territorial system and tax them at zero? And neither one of those actually is what we did. We ended up saying, well, let's find some rate in the middle of the tax he's at. And so what we're going to do is basically say companies have to pay tax on all those earnings that they've been shoring up in their foreign subsidiaries. At 15.5% if it's held in cash or cash equivalents, and 8% if it's held in other types of assets. OK, so now you can imagine this also is going to create some, some issues. How do you define cash and cash equivalents? So uh, I was at a meeting uh, yesterday in Washington, and, and somebody said, oh, there's this debate about live chickens in Peru. Because the live chicken, there's this liquid market for chickens. So is it cash or is it non-cash? Uh, so you can see there's going to be a lot of uh, probably issues with that. But companies have to pay that tax um, based on the numbers in 2017, and they have to record it in their financial statements in 2017. But they actually get eight years to pay the tax in cash to the US government. Uh, so that's going to be a lot of tax that companies have to pay on those earnings. But once they pay that tax, they're free to bring them back to the US. OK? Um, then from then on, once we assess this transition tax, from then on, there's going to be some limitations again in a minute here, but uh, from then on, basically, the active foreign earnings are not going to be subject to US tax. When there's a dividend paid from that IRS subsidiary back to the US, we're going to say that's tax free. OK, and that's the territorial part of the, the tax law. OK, but to prevent too much income shifting, we implemented this guilty in the beat. OK, what this guilty is, is basically this idea that if they earn too much high return income in a low tax jurisdiction, the US is going to tax it. And we're going to tax it at 10%, basically. So if they earn earnings that are too high, which is in excess of 10% of their tangible asset base, uh, the US is going to say, we're going to tax some of those foreign earnings currently in the US. And the idea, what they're trying to achieve there is that companies don't shift too much income out. They just leave it in the US, or we're going to tax it anyway. OK, and that's the guilty. It turns out it's quite onerous. Um, and basically, that's because the foreign tax credit system won't allow very many ta foreign tax credits against those earnings. So we're going to earn it. We're going to tax it here, meaning we're going to earn it foreign jurisdiction and tax it here. But the way the rules work, the foreign tax credits are very limited with this type of income. And so they're going to pay a lot more tax than, than maybe companies would have thought at first glance. Then the beat, that is like an alternative minimum tax. We're going to make companies compute their tax one way, then compute it another. And if the second way is too high, they're going to pay this alternative tax, essentially. And this also is quite onerous in a lot of ways because there's no foreign tax credits allowed against that tax. So we're going to say, hey, we're going to tax these, foreign, these earnings you have, but uh, we're not going to allow any foreign tax credits against that. So companies are quite worried about these provisions right now, and um, they're asking for some relief uh, in the kind of a corrections or a fixes to this tax act, so we'll see what happens. But as of now, there's these kind of sticks, you know, that prevent companies from shifting too much income out and from recording too much deductions in the US. 
And then again, like I described, this, this FIDI is basically an incentive to operate in the US and export. Um, the, the EU is already complaining that it does not comply with the OECD rules, and it's quite likely it doesn't comply with the WTO rules, so this will get challenged, certainly, and, and may not stay around. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip through that. So, you know, in terms of economic effects, a lot of companies are saying it's, it's too soon to tell what's actually going to happen. The regulations are not written yet. They're going to be written over the summer, hopefully, and done um, in the fall. So a lot of the technical rules aren't done yet, so there's still a lot of uncertainty. One thing I think that's certain is that we will not have trapped cash anymore. We will not have this cash sitting in foreign subsidiaries of multinationals because we've eliminated that uh, part of the, the code. If you look at some of the statistics that have come out already, firms saying what they're going to do with the tax savings, either in the, the earnings that they can bring back after that mandatory tax or because of the corporate tax rate reduction, uh, this is what they, what, it's, what at least Bloomberg calculated that has happened so far is that there's been stock buybacks, uh, business investments, payments and wages, and then some donations made. Uh, there's been a lot of press about this, so you might have seen um, CNN Money was keeping a scorecard for a while. Uh, they said workers six billion, shareholders 171 billion, and they, you know, uh, they try to kind of pitch it this way. But what goes to the workers is going to take more time, because the idea behind the the money getting to the workers is that companies will invest more, and that investment will increase the demand for labor, and then labor and wages will go up. So to get, see the effect in, in wages or labor, we're probably going to have to wait a little longer. Um, so this is kind of the initial scoreboard, but it, it's not the final one, I would say. And there's been a lot of headlines um, about what companies are going to do. Apple's going to have to pay $38 billion in taxes. That's just that repatriation tax, because they had that $250 billion uh, in earnings offshore. Um, my favorite one is this one. Hostess is going to pay bonuses in Twinkies as well as cash. So they're not only going to give cash bonuses to the workers, but they're going to hand out like Twinkies and Ding Dongs, I guess. Uh, so that's kind of funny. Uh, there was a recent survey by Deloitte um, of CFOs. Just this came out uh, last week, actually. And they asked CFOs of companies, and they had, I think, 160 companies reply to this survey. And this is what the CFOs were saying, is what they expected to happen was that the investment location, they expected higher investment in the US. 45% of the CFOs that answered it said this. And then um, you know, only about 5 or 6% thought that investment in a foreign location would increase. And if you, when Deloitte asked them, what do you think that you're going to do with this repatriated cash? Uh, you know, again, most companies, a lot of companies said they're going to pay down debt. And that makes sense, based on what I said before, is because companies were borrowing in the US because they couldn't bring that money back. So now that they can bring it back, they'll probably pay down some of that debt. Uh, and a lot of companies actually said they're going to hire new employees. And you know, of course, a lot of companies said they're going to buy back shares as well. So this is kind of initial evidence. It'll take a while, again, for all this to work itself out. Uh, to see. There's a lot of other issues going on at the same time. Uh, so, you know, I said there was a lot of pressure on the U.S. to reduce their tax rate. There was also a lot of pressure on corporations about their tax avoidance behavior, okay? Uh, so companies were, were doing this. They were shifting income offshore and doing these things, and there was a lot of pressure on them. So you might have seen press about Starbucks. Um, Starbucks was brought in front of the U.K. government in a hearing, and it turns out that they didn't pay any tax to the U.K., and for a long time. So people were picketing out in front of Starbucks stores and boycotting the stores. You know, uh, like there was a, a sign that said, too little, too latte, because they ended, up, <laughs> they ended up saying that they would pay tax, even though they didn't know it. So they ended up paying tax over to, over to the government. So there was all these people picketing. And then um, Apple's had a lot of the same thing, a lot of activists uh, against Apple before their tax avoidance. Um, and some of the signs there, so if you remember that commercial, it was, you know, I'm a Mac, I'm a PC, and they were dressed totally different. So some of the protesters had, I'm a Mac, I'm a taxpayer, like <laughs> totally different. Um, so there, there was a lot of pressure on the companies, too, and on the governments to try to rein in this corporate tax avoidance. And so the OECD took up this big project about base erosion and profit shifting, and they've issued a lot of guidance and new rules that companies and countries have to follow. 
The EU has actually um, sued a lot of US multinationals, Apple being kind of the poster child. So Apple now, according to the EU, owes Ireland $14 billion because what they're saying is Ireland provided state aid to Apple. Ireland does not want this money. It's the weirdest case because Apple doesn't want to pay it, Ireland doesn't want it. Uh, but the EU is saying that Apple has to pay it to Ireland. Uh, so these state aid cases are going on, um, and so Apple clearly is going to appeal, I think. Um, so we'll see what happens with those. But what I'm trying to say is we, we reform taxes in the U.S., but there's a lot of other activity going around around the globe about taxes, and so um, you know, there's going to be a lot of confounding effects, too, when we try to figure out what impact this tax act had. Um, and of course, again, other countries are going to respond to this act as well. So you know, basically the, the driving force behind this tax act was to get that corporate rate down to make us more competitive around the globe. Other parts of the tax code were changed also along the way. Um, domestic companies should benefit. I think there's no doubt they just got a rate drop from 35 to 21% and they got full expensing. The repatriation tax, I think for the most part is, is what I would call a win. You know, the government ended up getting 15.5 or 8% meaning they got something greater than zero, which is what they were getting pretty much before. And the companies kind of win also because now they can bring the money back to the US and they don't have to pay 35. So I think you know that was pretty well negotiated. Um, the net effect, we still don't really know. Ideally, the idea is it should increase investment in the US and kind of stop this income shifting offshore. Uh, some multinationals though have said it, it doesn't really get us far enough. They said they're like halfway across the Atlantic that's how they describe it, and they need a little more, but we'll, we'll have to see how they respond. Okay, is there any, I think we can open it up for, for questions now if anyone has any. Yeah. Um, I remember reading that the changes to the pass-through entity would cause um, like certain firms to suddenly, uh, the changes to the pass-through entity treatment would cause certain firms to change their structure mm -hmm. And I think one person suggested that, like, you know, all the employees of Google should convert themselves to S corps and just be paid that way instead of to, to get that preferential rate. Can you comment on that or explain what that uh, uh, controversy was about? Yeah, so uh, a little bit. So we don't know. There, there definitely will be what we call gaming. Almost with any tax provisions, obviously taxpayers try to figure out how to make it benefit them. And it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican, that's the truth. Um, just like I was saying about the state and local deduction, you know, people try to find workarounds. And the same is true here. I think um, there are several, several aspects of this. One is whatever taxpayers try to do, it is true the IRS is going to try to look at this carefully. Okay, the constraint, and they know this, they know there's gonna be a lot of gaming with respect to that provision. It's been talked about a lot. Um, the trouble is we don't have a lot of resources available to the IRS, so whether they can actually enforce this is, a, is another question, but it's, it's well known there will be a lot of gaming and that they need to look after that. The probably most legitimate type of gaming or structure changing, you might say, would be, say, a medical practice changing, splitting its practice, one with equipment and one with just the doctors. The way that rule works is that people who rely on their profession, um, they're much more severely limited. So accountants, lawyers, doctors, um, think consultants, uh, they, they are much more limited with respect to that pass-through provision. You can't earn too much money if you're in those provisions. Engineers and architects were carved out. <laughs> so they, they're not limited like the other professions for some reason. Maybe MIT had a big lobby, I have no idea. Um, so there was these different professions too. Um, but the most common one I think I've heard of that seems like it could pass muster is to split the businesses. Just a regular employee changing themselves over to be an S Corp I th seems like wouldn't really pass muster because even with a pass-through entity, you have to pay yourself reasonable comp. And so the reasonable comp compensation rules would say that so much of this would still be considered compensation and then whatever's left would be passed through. So they, we might see people try this, but it, it shouldn't pass 
Uh, but whether the IRS has enough resources to keep it from passing, we don't know. But it's a good question. Yeah, yeah? Is there any potential for product pricing to come down? Like if you have two identical <laughs> US clients, now their after tax returns have just gone up. And, and so, so essentially they both have a similar constraint in that they're now get it, uh, getting a better return, which means that the product pricing might come down. Is there any anything? So this like is that? an excellent question. Um, this is a question I think, you know, like public finance economists would, it'd be like the top two or three, they would ask God when they die. And, and this is the question. Who bears the burden of the corporate income tax? And it, it has to be one of three groups of people. So the C Corp, when I said the C Corp is an entity that pays the tax, that's all I mean is that C Corp writes a check but some individual somewhere has to bear the burden of the corporate tax. And it has to either be consumers through the pricing of the product, labor through the wages, or capital owners through their return on their investment. And we don't really know who bears it. Uh, there's a lot of studies on this. Um, and different studies lead you to different answers. So uh, we don't really know who bears the burden, but it's plausible that there will be some instances where the pricing of some products should come down and should benefit consumers. Uh, but in some cases, the benefits might go to labor, and in some cases, they might purely go to capital owners. Um, that we, we don't really know. But it has to end up in one of those three places. <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah? Terrifically helpful technical presentation, um, laying out the rationale for um, fixing a lot of things that were wrong with the with the yeah. system. Uh, you didn't mention a couple things. One was the net impact on this on revenue. Okay. Yeah. And the second is the impact of this on in, on wealth wealth distribution, wealth yeah. inequality, yeah. Uh, yeah. both of which are things I think we should be concerned about in our tax system. Yeah. You wanna, could you comment on on both of those? Yes. So. The way this rule was written, it allowed the scoring to be such that it was not revenue neutral. It, it is scored such that it will increase the deficits over the budget window, which is a 10-year window, by $1.5 trillion. And that was a decision they made. Um, in other words, they, we, whatever you want to say, the U.S., thought that getting that corporate rate down and attracting investment to U.S. Uh, was very important. And... Um, we want to do that, and ideally what would happen is if that works, then there'll be growth in the economy, and uh, hopefully we won't lose that much. I don't think most rational people believe the statement that it will pay for itself. That seems implausible. Uh, but on the other hand, it's, it's almost certain that the growth will not be zero. We just don't know where in that line it's going to be. Um, I think you're worried, and it's a good one, is that the national debt is getting too high and this increase, increases the deficits and then the debt, and, and that's certainly true. Uh, so at some point, we'll need to worry about this. You know, I wasn't in Washington long, but what you realize quickly is that everybody wants something. Um, so if the corporate rate's going down, the pass-through rate needs to go down, and the individual rate needs to go down. Everybody wants their share. In other words, nobody wants to pay for anything, <laughs> basically. Uh, so, in, in, you know, it, it's hard to get things passed because everybody wants lower taxes. And they want more spending, it seems like. Um, but you're exactly right. We should be worried about this, and we should be more worried about it than we, we actually are, it seems like. Um, wealth inequality? Wealth inequality is interesting. So I saw a paper presented yesterday, um, and I think it's, it's a very important paper. So Piketty and Saez in 2003 published a paper, and then you know, Piketty went on to write the book and everything else. And basically, in that paper, what they use is tax return data to compute income inequality. And what they show is that income inequality increased dramatically from 1960s to you know, today, let's say. And so a lot of work was done, and this is almost like an assumed fact now. What happened, I, um, these researchers within the government, so there's um, the co-authors, one is from Joint Committee on Tax and one is from the Office of Tax Analysis. And what they did is they um, went through and they analyzed the data. And what they show is that using tax return data, while it has some benefits, also has a lot of problems. And some of the problems are that there's a lot of unreported income on tax returns. Government transfers are not included. Uh, employer health insurance is not included. 
tax exempt income not included. Um, and there's a lot of other issues like that, like just the way it's computed. And when they compute this and do a constant income computing kind of all the types of income that taxpayers might get, 90% of the growth in income inequality that Piketty and Saya shows goes away. Well, they're, they're correlated, um, loosely. yeah, loosely. So wealth inequality, um, what, what would be your data besides like Piketty and Saya, well, say for example? Income inequality, as you said, can be talked away by the points you described, but wealth inequality has, has expanded even more dramatically. Yeah. And the only way to address wealth inequality is due to tax policy. And we've just taken a step in exactly the wrong direction. Yeah, I mean, um, so income inequality can be caused by natural causes, and it can be affected by policy choices. So, yeah, right, right. So that's not a tax issue. That's a, it's a policy issue. Um, th that's fine. I mean, I'm not arguing that we don't need to do something about it or anything. Um, I'm, that's not my area, really. But uh, you're you're right, and since we need to think about these issues clearly, um, but at the same time, if all of our corporations left the U.S. and we had no corporations or manufacturing here for people to work at, that would harm the income distribution as well. We could choose to put in a high rate for top individuals. We could choose that. We just didn't. I don't, I don't have a reason why. We dropped, we dropped it. Exactly. So I would say I didn't agree with that part of the, the, code, the new act either. Um, but the, the corporate rate had to come down. That had to happen. That was a driving force, and it, it really did have to happen. I mean, I really believe that. But we maybe should have gone way more progressive on the individual side. That, that spread that you identified that showed the 29% average is going to collapse, so everybody's lined up on 21%. Do you think all those loopholes have been closed? No. Ideally, we tightened the distribution. Um, but certainly, we didn't close all the loopholes. Yeah. I think one more. Yeah? You, uh, yeah. Um, I want to know, back to that graphic that the New York Times, I guess, did uh, on your paper, those companies that really are only, that, that were only effectively paying, you know, 9%, 11% in tax, even though the tax rate was 35, I'm kind of curious, how did they do that? <laughs> yeah, so are we. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, like I said, we, we've run a lot of regressions, and we can't really explain a lot of variation. It is true, companies that moved a lot of their income offshore, that, that is a large explanatory factor. The fact that foreign statutory tax rates came down and companies were reporting more income in foreign subsidiaries, that's a large factor. Um, and also, there were a lot of provisions put in the code kind of that narrows the base, trying to get companies to stay here. We had this domestic manufacturing deduction, trying to get companies to manufacture here in the US. Um, and that will explain some variation, because some companies get that and some don't. Um, and then you know, there's just some companies that run losses, say, for example, and they might end up in the lower end of the distribution. But like I said, we have some explanatory factors that we know, uh, like the multinationals and things like this. But we can't get a very high R squared in that regression, meaning we can't explain a lot of the variation in those effective tax rates over a large sample. There's some idiosyncratic factors that we can't exactly put our finger on. Is it also one of the drivers that for GAAP purposes, taxable income is, is quite different yeah. from what for, for tax purposes? So, so we're sort of mixing two, you know, two of them and saying you're not paying enough tax because when you're really coming off gap, you know, gap taxable income when, when in reality we're actually paying it on based on the taxable income from a tax point. Ah, so yes and no. So that's true with some studies. What we did there is we looked at their cash taxes paid, okay. but relative to book income. Um, so you're right, the gap earnings might have some effect. Yeah, that's a great question actually. Yeah, yeah. One more? No, one more. Yeah? 
Under the old system, you had that uh, depreciation recapture rules that that I always viewed as like a permanent deduction because you could expense up to at that time 500,000. I think it's now under bonus depreciation 2.5 or a million. You could fully expense it then later on you could sell the asset and you only pay capital gains up to your uh, So I think maybe you're talking about section 179. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, right. okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how do, so I guess, maybe we should take this offline, huh? a little technical. <laughs> so on the margin does that with smaller entities, whether it's a C Corp or an LLC, with the new, so now that the tax rate, you're not deducting at 35%. That's right. Right, That's you're right. deducting yeah. at 21%. Yeah. And so when you do the cap gains, it's about the same. However, does that affect LLCs more because of the pass-through structure? Does what, does the, the does benefits the, does of the deduction? Does the, yeah, the deduction on the, on the uh, yeah. depreciation recapture rules. I don't even know if the, they still exist. Yeah, they do. They yeah, exist. yeah. I mean, it is true. The corporate rate is low, so deductions are less valuable right. on the corporate side. That's true. And so the, the individual rate, if you're at the high rate and you get the qualified business income deduction, your rate would be 29.6, basically, effectively. Yeah. yeah so, so, so for a smaller entity, are you better off um, to realize the benefit of that, I'll call it a little bit of a loophole, if you're in an LLC pass-through structure versus a... I mean, in general, the answer would be yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank I think you. Uh, I'm being reeled in here. So thank you guys very much.